is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. If I was going to give my message a title, I would probably call it Painful Proclamation Passing. Painful Proclamation Passing. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Let's read the passage. You, therefore, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize, unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And I want to actually first draw our attention to that last verse there, that verse 7. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. In this verse, as throughout this whole book and throughout the Bible, we see a blend of the paradox of human responsibility and God's sovereignty. He doesn't say just think, he doesn't just say God will give you understanding. Sometimes we tend to go to one extreme or the other. I think we've well, we got to study, 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 and figure it out ourselves. Or on the other hand, you might kind of be mystical about it and say, you know, just pray for the Spirit to kind of pop a zap into our brain or something. And, and Paul here is showing that both are true. Consider what I say. Remember, Timothy, take time to think about what I've just told you. But know that it's the Lord who gives you understanding and will help you understand it. And so as we think about what Paul says in verses 1 to 6 this morning, let us lean on the Lord for, to give us understanding. Let's pray and ask him to illumine us as we consider these words. Father, these are your words. These are your people. We need your spirit to illumine us, to give light so that these words will be more than just words on a page, but they will be um, your message to us this morning. Our lives will be changed by your word. Amen. So, you know, verse 1 starts out with you, therefore, and, you know, you always have to ask what the therefore is there for. So, what's the setting of this? And what's he already been talking to Timothy about? This is Paul's last letter. He's almost dead, and he knows it. He's writing his best disciple, Timothy, from jail, from chains, actually. Paul will be executed soon for the gospel. And it is not a good time for the gospel for Paul. He said at his first defense, nobody stood with him. They all deserted him. One of his colleagues, Demas, deserted him, having loved his present world. Back in chapter 1, he told Timothy, all those who are in Asia, the province where Timothy was working, have deserted me. There were false teachers who were teaching that the resurrection had already taken place. Entering households, captivating weak women, laden with sins, as he talks about in chapter 3. So it is a tough time for the gospel. And what makes it even tougher is that Timothy, his best disciple, is faltering. If you look back in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, he tells Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel. So Timothy is holding back. Timothy is faltering. This is Paul's child in the faith. Paul had led him to the Lord. Paul had circumcised him. Paul had told the Philippians earlier that I have no one like-minded like Timothy. Paul had given Timothy um, the, the, um, the charge to lead reform and uh, aid the church in Ephesus that was struggling, and Timothy was faltering. And so Paul gives Timothy a charge to preserve the gospel that had been entrusted to him. Um, toward the, let's go like in chapter 1, verse 13, you see him saying, Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. The treasure he's talking about is the gospel message that he's entrusted to him. He's saying, retain that, guard that. And then here in chapter 2, he's, he turns and starts telling Timothy to pass that on. Don't just hold it. Don't just guard it. But pass it on. But first he gives him, in verse 1 of chapter 2, 
encouragement of where Timothy is going to find the strength that he needs to man up in an age when the gospel is not popular. He says, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The challenge of passing the gospel proclamation on requires strength. But law will not make you strong to do that. Just knowing that yeah, I need to share the gospel with people and, the, and Paul's counting on me, that's not going to do it. Grace is what strengthens us. As Paul had written earlier to the Corinthians, by the grace of God I am what I am. His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Grace is found, as Paul says here in verse 1, in Christ Jesus. Grace is not found anywhere else but in Christ Jesus because it's only Christ who came as our substitute. We have rebelled against God, dishonored God throughout our lives. We have chosen to go our own way. And as Isaiah said, the Lord has laid on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus who came, lived perfect life in our place, died in our place, receiving the wrath of God that we should have gotten. He rose from the dead and now is our advocate in the throne room of grace. So be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He's encouraging him with the gospel from the very onset here. And then in verse 2, he begins to give Timothy a specific plan for how to pass on this proclamation that's so endangered so that the candle doesn't get snuffed out, so to speak. The, uh, he says, the things which you have heard from me, things which you, Timothy, have heard from me, in the presence of many witnesses and trustees, the faithful men will be able to teach others. So there's there's kind of four generations there. You see, okay, I'm, you know, Paul, I've shared to you, Timothy. Timothy, you pass that on to faithful men who will then be able to teach other people also. And so the first thing there, the things you've heard from me, from, from Paul, our tendency when we're sharing the gospel with people sometimes is to think, I can, I've got some pretty good ideas of my own. And Timothy probably had some pretty good ideas of his own, too. But our main job as evangelists is not to be sources of information, but to be relayers of information, to just pass on the proclamation that we have from Paul and the other apostles and the rest of Scripture to people, and not to think we need to invent uh, some helpful truths of our own. And he says, the things you have heard from me, because not every source out there claiming to be sharing God's word actually is. Not every source of scriptural teaching is good. There's errant Bible teachers out there. There's uh, psychology sometimes dressed up to look like biblical teaching. Paul is telling Timothy, stick with the things you've heard from me. Stick with the things that God has spoken, that has God's guarantee. Because there may be other good truths out there that people have good ideas, but human words don't have God's guarantee behind them. God's words do. So stick with the things that will really matter. And he says, the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. So Paul had probably talked about a lot of things. Paul had probably written other letters that we don't have. But there are some core truths, things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, some core truths that Paul had given, that Timothy had heard from Paul, that he wanted him to focus on. Why, I'm going to ask you actually answer this, yeah, wake up now and actually answer a question. Um, why would Paul just want Timothy to pass on these specific things that he had said in the presence of many? Why would he, why would he describe the core truths as being things that he had said in the presence of many witnesses? Why didn't he just say, pass on the really important things? Why did he say, Pass on the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. What do you think? Anointed teaching. How do you mean? He was uh, under the Holy Spirit's leading and directing when he preached. Okay. Okay. Judy? So it could be the argument that he didn't what Paul said? That's, that's, a, that's a very important point. Um, there would be witnesses to corroborate if other people came to him and said, no, no, you're just making that up. Paul didn't actually say that. There would be witnesses um, to, to back him if he up. So that, that's important. Okay. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. 
Well, at least say it this way. Like when you're over in the fellowship hall talking to somebody about something, hmm. um, is, which would be more important, more likely? The thing you're talking about over there, or if you get to get up and talk in front of 50 people like I'm doing today, do you save your important stuff for the one-on-one -on -one conversations or for when you talk to a lot of people? I think that would be another reason that the things that Paul chose to talk about when he was with a larger group of people would be the things that were more important. Um, there's also some speculation that Paul may have been referring to Timothy's ordination sermon um, because of back in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says that the, uh, uh, you, written, you uh, uh, six twelve. he says, you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So he could be referring to that. But the thing we do know for sure about the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, we know that Paul's most public speeches would have been his most important. And so, from this we are reminded that our tendency, often in the pulpit and out of the pulpit, is to focus on things that aren't so important, don't we? You know, we, we tend to you know, get distracted by, and even divided by, things that are you know, like wine or grape juice or you know, um, whatever particular eschatological um, view you hold, you know, the pre, mid, or post, or all that stuff. And, and our tendency is to get distracted by non-essentials or unprovables. And we need to stick with the simple, essential truths of God's word, primarily. You know, like the virgin birth, the death of Jesus in our place, the cross, the resurrection, um, God as creator, our sinfulness, you know, that the essential truths. So then he says, pass those on to faithful men. Our tendency is, well, actually, let me ask you, I'll ask you another question. What is our, why does he have to remind Timothy to focus on faithful men? Derek. Uh, faithful ones because the women are included in this because they deal with other women where they can pass on the truth, the actual truth, being faithful in presenting the gospel to them. The one, one thing I think of is that our tendency is to get distracted by people who are gifted, popular, you know, you think, oh, those are the people who invest in, you know, they're really talented people. We'll focus on them. The, the likable people, the prominent people, maybe the rich people. So we'll, we can get distracted by those people, you know, um, invest time in them. Or, or on the other hand, we might go to the other extreme and focus on the noisy, disruptive people and get caught up in arguments. So we might, were you going to say something? Faithful men pass it on to their families. That's true. Which most of us don't do in good enough job. The, the main, and, 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 and that, that's a good point. And so the main thing, you know, the reason why Paul is saying focus on faithful men is because faithful men are the ones who will actually succeed in passing it on to the next generation of Christians, the people over here, right? Because the, the talented people might not do that. They might just get caught up in studying or, or get busy with life or whatever. But the faithful men will pass it on. And Paul wants to make sure that the gospel goes on. It doesn't just die out after one generation. Um, okay, verse 3. Now he kind of turns the corner here. He's talking about proclamation passing. But now he starts talking about suffering. Again. Sharing suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So why is it that proclamation passing often involves suffering? Isn't this just a simple transfer, uh, transfer of information? You know, okay, here's the facts about Jesus' life and death, resurrection. Why should that involve any suffering for us? Why is he telling Timothy to get ready for suffering? Whenever you start changing li lives, you the fire starts. The because for the sake of the, of the gospel, people were um, suffering persecution. They were suffering persecution. I'm just asking why is this kind of it's kind of a weird question, but why is the gospel why does the gospel create persecution? Paul in, in chapter three actually says everyone who chooses to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Why is that? That, because not everybody wants to uh, believe in believe in them because uh, they think they know too much and stuff like 
Yeah, they, that's, get, they get arrogant. That's exactly right. I don't need this Jesus guy. I'm, I'm, I can I can be righteous on my own. I don't need an alien righteousness from somebody outside myself. Yes. It's the, the, the whole concept of the gospel is naturally offensive to us, isn't it? Because we want to believe that we can pull ourselves up out by our own bootstraps. And so it does involve suffering. And he gives Timothy three analogies of how the suffering should work in his life in verses 4 to 6. First analogy, of course, is soldiers. Um, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of every day life so they, they please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. It's obvious, you know, soldiers give up business involvement. You know, soldiers, act, you know, active duty soldiers don't take side jobs at Walmart, you know? They, they're just a full-time soldier. There are no part-time military jobs. You're either active, reserve, or discharged. There's not, nothing else. So um, if you're a soldier, you don't have time or permission to get entangled in other things. The second illustration, verse 5, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Now, when you think right now about an athlete breaking the rules, um, who do you think of right now? Yeah, yeah, Lance Armstrong, right. Um, but what he's talking about here is not just breaking, um, not just avoiding bad things like drugs that Lance Armstrong got involved in, because that would be wrong even if you weren't an athlete, right? He's talking about avoiding things that would be legitimate if you weren't an athlete, um, but are forbidden to people who are involved in the game. For example, there's all kinds of rules for Olympic sports. Um, there's there's Olympic ping pong or Olympic table tennis. There's all kinds of rules for, for how to play that. Things that would be fine for you know, normal people. Like for example, um, when you're playing Olympic ping pong, these are important rules, so make sure you remember these. Um, you're allowed to towel off every six points during a match, starting from 0-0. Zero, zero. You're also allowed to towel off at the change of ends in the last possible game of the match. But you know, if you if you, you know if the sweat's dripping down your eyes after just five points, tough luck, you gotta wait. You know? Now if you were just an ordinary person not playing it the Olympics, you know, you could probably towel off whenever you wanted, right? Um, or another, another rule is the, the free hand, which is the hand that's not holding the racket, your free hand cannot be put on the playing surface at any time. Hmm. You can put your racket hand on the playing surface, you can sit on the playing surface, you can even stand on the playing surface, but you can't put your free hand on the playing surface. Now, just one of the rules. Now, if you, like, again, if you weren't an Olympic athlete, you could probably do whatever you wanted there, right? But, there's, there's special rules for if you want to get the, the gold medal for ping pong, you got to follow the rules, right? Um, the third illustration he gives, farmers, verse 6, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Now, from the way this verse sounds, it <coughs> seems likely that the hard, hardworking farmer he's talking about is not the landowner, but probably someone working for the landowner. It sounds like on a commission based on how hard you work. You know, if you work the hardest, then you get the first pick of the, you know, you can pick out which watermelon you want, pick the juiciest watermelon for yourself, you know, if you work the hardest, it's all the farmhand. Um, so he's using these three illustrations to show him how people, just even ordinary unsafe people do this all the time in these jobs. Soldiers, athletes, farmers, they give up pleasure that just a, an ordinary citizen would enjoy. You know, the, the hardworking farmer loses out on leisure time. He gets to pick, especially during harvest time, he gets to pick which 12, 16 hours of the day he wants to work, right? Um, and the athlete loses out on you know, being able to put his free hand on the table. And the, the, the soldier loses out on being able to do other things besides being a soldier. But they all embrace those restrictions willingly because that's part of the job, right? And, and like I said, even unsaved people do this all the time in their jobs. Yeah. Uh, another modern example would be journalists. You know, if there's some disaster in some remote region of the world, some some journalists will get on a plane and go there and do whatever it takes to get there, get the story, and broadcast it to the rest of us, right? Even if they're not a Christian, even if it's dangerous for them, they could get shot. They, they you know, they, uh, they could get held up by bandits or whatever. They'll go out there and get the story. Um, and so they, they suffer, even unsafe people will suffer and deny themselves for their calling, their, their job, whatever the things they love. And they don't even have our power source. They don't have the Holy Spirit like we do and Timothy did. So Paul 
Paul is using these occupations as an illustration to Timothy of how Timothy too is going to need to give up good things, things that, that ordinary people can enjoy that are not sinful. He's going to need to give those up if he's going to successfully pass the proclamation on. So the suffering involved is not just the suffering of persecution for the gospel, but it's also the suffering of giving up good things, legitimate things, things that are not sinful, giving up those things to have more freedom for sharing the gospel. And our fruitfulness as a church here, our fruitfulness is more in danger from good things than from bad things. We're probably more in danger here from Country Magazine than we are from Playboy, because we all know to avoid Playboy, don't we? But Country Magazine, is there's nothing bad about Country Magazine. It's great, you know, we enjoy it, right? But you can waste time on it, can't we? And get um, we, some other illustrations of just kind of good things that are not wrong, but we could, but which could rob us of fruitfulness. Um, we might be in more danger from watching football than from watching the commercials, because we know to turn the commercials off, right, or look the other way. But we can waste an hour or two watching football and think nothing of it, right? And, and, and it's not nothing sinful about it, right? The the we might be in more danger from earning money than from stealing money. Hmm. It might be perhaps that bread is a greater danger to us than beer. Mr. Rogers might be more of a danger to us than Jerry Springer. Pets might be, be more of a distraction to us than tattoos. Um, golf could be a greater hindrance to our fruitfulness than gambling. Uh, and again, I, I hope you understand, I'm not saying that the first things I mentioned, that those things are sinful, or that the second things are okay. I'm not saying that, oh, well, you know, Country Magazine and Playboy are the same thing, so I might as well just go get the Playboy. No, I'm not saying that. The, but I'm saying that as Christians, we're in more danger from the good things than the bad things. You see what I'm saying? Now, now you might be thinking, you know, couldn't you go overboard with this and become like a monk or something? You know, we wouldn't want to do that. Um, I think that in our American culture today, the, the, the culture that we have here, we're a long ways yet from monkdom. Um, that, that is a danger, but um, we're a long ways from it. Um, here is what Richard Baxter said. He was a minister in the 1600s. He said, recreation to a minister, he was talking to pastors, but this would apply to all of us as believers, as ministers to each other. Recreation to a minister must be as wedding is with the mower. By wedding he means sharpening, and by mower he means like the scythe that you would use to cut grass because they didn't have lawn mowers back then. The recreation to a minister must be as wedding sharpening is with the mower that is to be used only so far as necessary for his work. May a physician in plague time take any more relaxation or recreation than is necessary for his life? And so many are expecting his help in case of life and death. Will you stand by and see sinners gasping under the pains of death and say, God doesn't require me to make myself a drudge to save them? Is this the voice of ministerial or Christian compassion, or rather of sensual laziness and diabolical cruelty? Here's uh, what John Piper um, said on a, in a similar vein. He said, My sense is that in the prosperous West, the danger in the church is not that there are too many overly zealous people who care too deeply about the lost and invest hazardously in the cause of the gospel and ruin their lives with excessive mercy to the poor. For every careless saint who burns himself out and breaks up his family with misdirected zeal, I venture there are a thousand who coast with the world treating Jesus like a helpful add-on but not as an all-satisfying, all-authoritative king in the cause of love. Paul himself models this kind of radical sacrifice for the gospel, doesn't he? Like when he was writing 1 Corinthians, he told Corinthian people, to this present hour, while I'm writing the letter, we are both hungry and thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated, and are homeless. And Jesus, of course, himself was homeless. He said, you know, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the, son of the man, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. It's kind of amazing, isn't it, that we follow a, a guy who didn't even have a pillow. Um, so this is a call to suffering. Paul is calling Timothy to suffering, but Paul is not calling Timothy to sacrifice. 
if you work 80 hours a week for six months for your boss and he doesn't pay you anything, you've sacrificed. But if he gives you $25 an hour and time and a half for overtime and medical benefits and vacation time, you've suffered for those six months, but you haven't sacrificed because you're going to get well paid for it, right? And notice the rewards in these three illustrations that Timothy had been given by Paul. The rewards that the soldier was after. He wanted to please the superior officer, probably in hopes of getting a promotion or a better position, getting some kind of honor. The athlete goes through all those restrictions in the Olympics or whatever. Back in Paul's time, the, 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 uh, you know, your translation might say prize, might say crown. The actual word is crown. Back then, the crown was, according to the internet, anyhow, the crown that they would give Olympic winners back then was a wreath of pine or wilted celery. Um, and so, but, but you would be famous, right? You'd be the, the one that got the crown, right? So the athlete is willing to suffer, embrace the restrictions of the rules, in order to get the fame of winning. In the farmer, um, his prize that he was after was you know, getting the first share of the crops, the best, the most valuable crops, which he could either sell or eat or enjoy himself. So possessions, money. Um, so the pleasing the superior officer, kind of promotion, position, fame, um, with being crowned if you're an athlete, the money, possessions, food if you are a farmer. And quite honestly, these prizes that these three categories of people would knock themselves out for, these prizes aren't all that impressive when you really think about it. But on the other hand, don't a lot of the people in our world today knock themselves out just to get these kind of things, these kind of rewards? Um, these are the kinds of things that people all around us are chasing after still today, aren't, aren't they? As Paul said in, in another passage, he said, they do it for a perishable crown, but we an imperishable. Paul was motivated by the rewards awaiting, awaiting him. The, uh, he started out the book talking about the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Jesus brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Just later, there in chapter 2, if you look at uh, like verses 11 to 13, he's encouraging Timothy with the rewards. If we, die, if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. Um, and he talks in chapter 4, Paul says, um, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. Think about soldier. I have fought the good fight. Athlete, I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, the crown of the reward. Far better than the crown of wilted celery, right? The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. That was what was motivating Paul. That was why Paul was willing to go through all the sacrifice of being homeless and beaten up in jail and chains, all that stuff because he knew the reward would be worth it. The, and that is why the false doctrine that was being spread that Paul was warning about in this book was so dangerous. The, rest of the, the doctrine they were teaching that the resurrection had already taken place. And that teaching was overturning the faith of some because if you believe that what we have now is as good a thing as things are going to get, you aren't going to want to share in suffering for the gospel now, are you? You're going to want to have your best life now. And, you know, before we criticize Mr. Osteen, do we, who hate the prosperity gospel, actually live much differently than he does? As far as our willingness to let go of good things for the sake of the gospel. When, when we are lured away from the best things, toward bad things or even toward good things, we need to realize that to yield to the temptation would be too great a sacrifice. Paul, again, wasn't calling Timothy to sacrifice. Paul was calling Timothy away from sacrifice <laughs> toward suffering. Because if Timothy had just played it safe, Timothy would be sacrificing the reward, the greater reward that was to follow. If Timothy embraces suffering now, he will get the reward in the future. Am I making sense? I hope that's not confusing. Um, uh, you know, like some, some, an example for me, sometimes, you know, I have a choice of uh, something small here. Here's, a, here's a, Because most of the choices we face in life aren't between a, a good thing and the best thing, aren't they usually something small? 
rather than, I mean, we have those, those moments in our life where we have to make a big choice. But a lot of them are just little small choices that add up over time, you know. Like for me, sometimes it'll be a choice between, uh, I'll talk, got ready to go to bed, and, and, and I'll see somebody put up some interesting new YouTube, you know, only like five minutes on, on Facebook, and, oh, this looks really fascinating. The, uh, um, you know, I think, so I've got a choice then, stay up an extra five minutes, and, and be a little bit more groggy in the morning when I get up to try to spend time with the Lord, or, or go to bed now and be a little more fresh when I get up to try to spend time in the Lord. It's a small choice. It's a good thing. Nothing wrong with watching that innocent YouTube. And the best thing, you know, time with the Lord that's undistracted and I can focus. Or, you know, another simple example, you know, saying no to that extra piece of pie that would blow your mind when you try to pray and give you that kind of sugar slump afterwards, right? So. But on the other hand, the danger we can, there, there, the other danger we can fall into is becoming kind of prideful over our asceticism, you know, our, our discipline, thinking, you know, hey, look at me, you know, I'm, look at how much I'm giving up to the gospel. But when we do that, we actually show we aren't, we don't understand, we don't believe that we're actually going to be rewarded for this. You know, you, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't brag that you, uh, what's the illustration here? Okay, something simple. Um, <laughs> okay, if if, um, if if you jog around the church campus, let's say 20 times, that'd be a lot of work, right? Jog around the church campus 20 times. But if somebody paid you $2,000 for that, you would do it, right? You'd figure out, you would have had to get a wheelchair. You would do it, right? And um, you wouldn't be prideful about it. You know, I'm better than those other people who don't run around the church property. I'm lucky you get to do this, right? So, so in the same way, um, when we don't suffer for the gospel, or when we suffer, when we do suffer, but murmur about it, we show that we don't really believe that we'll be rewarded for our suffering. So, to bring all this to a conclusion, Paul is saying to Timothy, you need to pass on the proclamation. It's going to cost, but it will be worth it. So the challenge to us today is, do we really believe, do we really believe that the task of passing on the gospel to faithful men will lead to such a reward that we are willing to forego the fleeting crowns of this life in order to completely devote ourselves to it. So let's take a, a couple of minutes just to, to ponder what the Lord has said to us in his word this morning, and then we will have our time of giving.